All right, Naomi. NCLEX book. Hesse. I was going to give you a list of what to just kind of skim through, what to look at, really read. If you have time to read it all, it's like, I don't know how many pages, a lot, but it's so good. It is so good. So I would recommend that if you feel weak in a certain area, find that in that chapter six. It's chapter six of the book, isn't it, Naomi? Chapter six. I have an older version of the book. Is it chapter six? Okay, chapter six of the book. Uh, medications are in there. There you go. Which one is that one? I wound up getting uh, the seventh just to see if it would have like um, the next gen questions. Oh, okay, 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 okay. good. Okay. And then that, yeah, that's out. Okay, good. Does it have next gen in it, Devon? What a bit yes, do you know yeah, your it's, it's that one, but it's just the yeah. next. Yeah, y'all have yeah, six next edition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The sixth edition is what we're using now. But Devon decided he had to get ahead. <laughs> I have the fifth edition, so <laughs> so um, the Hesse does have some next gen questions on it, but they're pilot questions. Okay, you're not going to necessarily. It's not going to be necessarily a graded. Question. Okay, they're testing out the waters because on the next NCLEX exam, which starts in April, there are it's an NCLEX it's an it's an N next gen NCLEX. Okay, so there are so it's and and I want to try to do some of that today. Um, one thing that worked out really well was when I was working uh, with Karen just a few minutes ago. I realized that one tool I was using was really helpful in making you really think about what do you need to do for this client, okay? So it really helps, okay? So you've been reading the book. Anybody been doing anything else? I've been doing this comprehension, the SCE comprehension, the 125 questions. Okay, 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 all right. So Monday, I met with a student from another class, and he said, I have some, it was during this, the group tutoring, and he was the only one that showed up. So um, he said, I have some, some NCLEX questions that, that I don't understand why I didn't get them right. And so we went over NCLEX questions. We went over it for an hour and a half, and it was, it was time well spent because it helped him to think, okay, so why is that correct? going through the rationales. So it just kind of built not only his knowledge, but his ability to answer questions. So that was a good time, well, time well spent, okay? So I, I am having another study group. And the one I did today, I did record, so I'll share that with you. Uh, tomorrow at um, two o'clock uh, Eastern. And then um, I think Friday, I don't even remember, but, um, Anyway, and then during class, all right? So you, you should be prepared for your HESI if you use all the tools we give you, okay? You said tomorrow at two o'clock? I think I have it at two o'clock. Hi, Megan. I didn't Hi. see you down there. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Oh, it's good to see you. It's good you to too. see you again. Um, yeah, I believe tomorrow at two. Uh, let me double check. Okay. Tomorrow. Thursday at two o'clock. Yes. Okay. The same Zoom ID? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I'm doing it again on Friday at three o'clock. Okay. Before my five o'clock class. <laughs> yeah. So I'm on Zoom a lot these days, just helping people get ready for the HESI. Okay. Yeah. So when you think about how you've been doing in this class. And I know everybody did horribly. They feel like they did at least on that very first exam. It was pretty tricky, but it seemed like most everybody improved as the quarter progressed. In fact, I saw improvement on the quizzes uh, and you know, towards the end, the last one. So, you know, you have uh, quizzes, the next gen quizzes, um, there's what, 20 questions. Those are not timed. So use them as a study tool. 
okay? Your labor and your postpartum and then your newborn, okay? They're not kind and neither are your NCLEX. So really work on those questions. Look up the answers so you get all 100% right, okay? So do that. And you have your HESI uh, practice exam for this week. If you didn't do the one from last week, get it done. You can still access it uh, through the 19th, I think. So make sure you do that. And then you have another set of NCLEX questions. So that's what's left. So do the best you can on the, your remaining homework because every little point is going to count in the end. Okay, I've seen too many students not pass this course with a 77.8, 77.5. It just breaks my heart thinking if they'd only completed all of their case studies, they might have been able to pass. Okay. All right. So let's try something new today. So bear with me as I try this new thing. And you tell me if you can't see something. All right. Right. What do I want to start with? Let's start. Let's talk about preeclampsia real quick. Okay. So I'm opening this up. You should be able to see this whiteboard. And this is what we call, let me move it a little bit. Can you see it okay? Is it too big or too little? Okay. So this is what we call a collaborating board. You're able to click on it and you should be able to move things around, okay? As students, okay? So if you see here, if Beth, Elizabeth has already got her name, her, her, her cursor up there. So let me move this back over here. So this is preeclampsia. It just doesn't seem like it's very big. Let me see if I can move, make it a little bigger. This is what I don't like about it. you can't absolutely control. I'll I'll shrink it in a minute. So we have a picture here of the brain, the lungs, the liver, and the kidneys. Okay. And then over here, we have a placenta. And so we've got preeclampsia developing in this placenta, okay? <laughs> All right, let me move it down. You see, fit to screen. There we go. All right, you see you got your cursors on there? I see you got your cursors on there. So what you would need, we need to do is we have a client with preeclampsia, okay? And we know what preeclampsia does. It causes blood vessels to spasm in the brain, the lungs, the liver, and the kidneys. And so the, those particular organs are affected, okay? We see poor functioning or injury if we don't intervene. So we know we have to intervene. So we've got some magnesium started, okay? So what you need to do is, to the left, it says subtherapeutic. In the middle, it says therapeutic. And on the right side, it says toxi. Can you see that? So what you need to do, which one of these, these uh, sticky notes do you want to pull over to the subtherapeutic? In other words, which signs would you want to move over to subtherapeutic? If you're giving magnesium and it's not working, it, the level of magnesium is subtherapeutic, what would you see in your client? So somebody just grab a sticky note and move it over there. And we'll be able to tell who it was because your name's on there. Subtherapeutic, what would you see? Just click on it and drag it over. Okay, yeah, maybe eclampsia. So what does that mean? A seizure. All right, headache, proteinuria, good. You like <laughs> Good. Anything else? Shortness of breath, that's from the pulmonary edema. What else? If it's subtherapeutic, what else might you see? Would eclampsia be toxic though? I don't no, no, no. 
Visual changes, absolutely. Slurred speech, kind of unlikely. So where would slurred speech be? There you go, toxic, yeah, toxic. Too much magnesium. It's like, almost like stroke activity. Okay, high blood pressure. Yeah, well, that blood pressure is not too, too bad, but yeah, okay. What else? There's, there's another one in there. Clonus, very good. Clonus and no urine output. Okay, that's acceptable. Okay, so I think you got everything. So I really don't have too much therapeutic. What are some therapeutic things you see there? Urine output is good. Yeah, yeah, we need it to be above 30. Okay, what else? We're giving magnesium and things are improving. Yeah, yeah, Mia, that's right. Drag it over there. You had it. <laughs> yeah, drag it over there. That's that's therapeutic. Deep tendon reflexes of two plus is absolutely therapeutic. Yeah. Can you do it? <laughs> there yeah. you go. You got it. All right. So muscle weakness, definitely toxic. Heart rate, 50, respirate, yeah, those are all toxic. Yeah. So high magnesium levels is going to slow the central nervous system down. And so low respiratory rate, muscle weakness, slurred speech, hypotension, which I don't have in there, are all going to see. What, what uh, would you see? You could also move this one back over here. No urine output. High magnesium levels paralyze the kidneys. Okay. So I'm trying to help you remember this so that when you have a question about preeclampsia, you know what you need to see. Uh, 90 over 60 um, might be therapeutic or it might be a little low. Um, but if our client has bradycardia, that's for sure. Um, toxic. Okay. So good. Can you remember that now? Didn't last long enough, did it? <laughs> okay. Any questions about that? So what's a, a, a um, deep tendon re reflex with um, that would go along with clonus? Like the feet? Yeah, the clonus is the feet. Mm -hmm. What other, what, what number? So patellar, a three plus reaction, a very brisk would go over here. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm not done this one, but we could work on it. Okay, so your client, signs and symptoms. Venn diagram is just, I couldn't get rid of that, but it's just the way this is set up, okay? So if you have a client with vaginal bleeding, a client that's nauseous, throwing up, pelvic pain, and a positive HCG, what are some interventions that you want to do to figure out what's going on with your client? Because I've got 
here, one, two, three, right in the middle. These are possible diagnoses. So this is what we call differential diagnosis. How do we know what's going on with our client? Well, we got to figure out what else we need to do for this client. Intervention. So what are some things that we want to do? To find out what's going on with our client. Ultrasound, I love it. <laughs> Ultrasound, Mia says. Okay, good. Labs, good. What labs in particular? Electrolytes, okay, good. <laughs> so electrolytes, what else do we wanna know? Your analysis, okay. What do you know, want to know from the year analysis? I don't know what happened to our thing, but. Do we know how far along our patient is? Oh, good question. See what happens. Um, let's say um, 11 weeks. Ah. Maybe. I don't know what happened to our blue one. I think we'd want to get past medical history. Okay, yeah, we do need to do a medical history. Okay, medical history, what else? What kind of a medical history are you talking about? I'm gonna move this. Um, like if um, our patient has had miscarriages in the past. Okay, any, okay, so obstetrical history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Diabetes. So you're, what we're doing here, we've got this client and my circles are messed up. So um, she, she's in the ER. I'm sorry, I didn't give you any history. She's in the ER, vaginal bleeding, nausea and vomiting, pelvic pain, 11 weeks, positive HCG. Um, we're trying to intervene right now for what's going on right now. Okay, so we have labs we've drawn. Uh, we've got an ultrasound ordered. And we're talking her, to her a little bit about it. Has she gone through this before? Side sort of thing. What else do we want to do? Any trauma? Like, was there an accident? Like, okay. Good. Yeah. Trauma. Has she fallen? Has she fallen? So you're thinking because of the bleeding, you want to know if she's fallen? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, because she's got pelvic pain as well. So. You know, did she fall on her belly or was she involved in some kind of an accident or something? Okay. So her ultrasound is going to tell us a lot of information. What else do we need to do for her? Get her some nausea meds. Okay, good, good. Vita signs. Yeah. Antiemetics. Or an IV. Get her an IV start. All right. Get some fluid going. Get some fluid going. So what kind of fluid do you want to run, Megan? Uh, 0.9. Okay. And we're giving her anti -amate. So she's feeling better. So let's do some labs here. So let's say we have a potassium. Three point what would be what would be what do you think her potassium would be if she was hypokalemic from vomiting? Three. 
be low? Like 2.7? That's really low. That's really low. Is it a crisis? Mm -hmm. So what happens if a potassium is that low? This is a med surge question. It can affect the heart. Yeah, definitely. So she might have some serious dysrhythmias. So if that's the case, if her potassium comes back that low, we need to get her on a cardiac monitor. Very good. Very good. So let's put her on a cardiac monitor. Let's replace her potassium. So you know that if you're administering potassium greater than 20 milliequivalents, your client always has to have a cardiac monitor on. Did you know right. that? Okay. So we're going to put her on telemetry. So uh, um, ultrasound. Uh, let me just do another one. Ultrasound. What might we see? What could possibly be some things we would see? Pelvic pain, vaginal bleeding, nausea and vomiting. What could be going on? Ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic. Ectopic. What else? If the fetus is alive. If the fetus is alive. When you, you mean, um, if, is it a viable pregnancy? Mm -hmm. If there's any heart rate on the fetus. Okay, okay. Let's say there isn't a heartbeat. Okay. So what's what would be what would you call that? Miscarriage. Don't they call that some kind of an abortion, like um a spontaneous abortion? Yeah. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, yeah. It's it, yeah. I don't know why it didn't shriek down like the other one did. Oh, my 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 whiteboard is a mess. Okay, it's still pretty so neat. Though. Yeah, it is fun. So we come up with ectopic. Let me go back and reduce this. Let's go to forty-eight. Spontaneous abortion. And there's one more thing it could be. Is it the trophoblastic disease? All right, a molar pregnancy. Yeah. So if we saw a molar pregnancy, would we see a viable fetus? No. No. Would we see a fetus at all or no. embryo at all? No. Not likely, not likely. We see just a bunch of trophoblastic cysts that have become like vesicles and stuff, little clusters. Okay, good, good. All right. So those are the possible outcomes. What uh, else could it be if, she, if we remove the pain? Vaginal bleeding, some nausea and vomiting, positive, 11 weeks. Is it a lot of vaginal bleeding? Uh, significant amount, yeah. What if she was um, 16 weeks? No pain. 
vaginal bleeding. Placenta previa. Placenta previa. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Good job. I can see this is going to work. Okay, let's see if I have any more. Oh, yes. All right, so in this one, let me see if I can get. You'll notice at the top, it says antepartum, interpartum, postpartum, and newborn. And this is still, you know, in the works, okay? So, um, and then you'll notice over here, non-stress tests, all the different tests and stuff, and just different concepts. And then down below, you'll see here, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And so let's talk about in the antepartum period again. GP status, okay? I'm trying to remember what I'm doing for this. Okay, so labs. So for the first trimester, what are some things we're focused on for a normal pregnancy? What would we be, no, uh, not, not down there, up above, a normal pregnancy. Let's talk about a normal pregnancy, okay? So we've got all the assessment that we do, right? GP status, signs and symptoms, last menstrual period, estimated due date, history, culture. Don't forget about assessing culture and nutritional status, social status, what's going on socially any signs of depression, so do some screening, and then exposures, okay? If we have a client with diabetes, type two, type one, or type two, how would this first column change, a first trimester? So that's down here where high risk is. What are some things we think about with diabetes in the first trimester? Miscarriage, malformation. Okay, so congenital uh, malformations, miscarriage, good. I'm glad you thought, thought about the spontaneous abortion. What else? Anything else you want to know? Was she diabetic First, before she got pregnant? Yeah, she was. So we just need to know um, how her blood sugars run and how well controlled they are. Okay, good. So we need to do some education and give her some guidance mm -hmm. and talk to her about what she's eating, um, what her history is, what medication. Yeah, so good. So for pregnancy, the most important part is that their blood sugar stays steady. Exactly. That it, that it stays at target levels. And what are those target levels? Uh, 60 to 100. Okay, so one hour after she eats, what do we want it to be less than? I can't remember. What's the, what's the range one hour after she eats? And you can put it right in there. So I might go ahead and put it in there. One hour after she eats. The 120 to 150? We want it to be less than what? One hour after she 180? eats. 140? 140. 180. 140. Okay. So 140, and so how low do we don't want it to go? Any lower than what? 90. 90. I'm just, I just want to say that I can't see anything on the board. So that's why I'm not typing anything. You can't see anything? No, the same thing happened in McBride's class. I can't see anything on that. 
that's odd but everybody else can see it right yes that's odd christina i know the same thing happened it was only me it's probably my computer <laughs> Okay, actually, so 9140 would be good. Okay, what about two hours after she eats? Less than what? Somebody fill it in. Take a chance. 100? No, that's, that's, that's a little low. What do you think, Eduardo? What should it be two hours after? 120. 120, 120? yeah. 120. No greater than 120. Okay. So one hour, no greater than 140. And two hours, no greater than 120. You do need to know that. Okay. When she wakes up in the morning. So a fasting AM. We don't want ever. Would you say, Eduardo? Lower than 100? Six, between 60 and what? 90. 90, yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So we've got the first trimester taken care of. What about the second trimester for our diabetic client? What's occurring if she's not in the target range like we've been talking about? What if she hovers 150 one hour after she eats, which is too high? What if she hovers around 150, 160? What are some things we might see in that second trimester? Big baby. Big baby. So hyperglycemia, we're calling it. So what do you call big baby? Microsomia. Microsomia. Macrosomia. <clears throat> what else? So this also includes a third trimester, really. So she has to be on the insulin? She might need to if her Protein sugars are not protein in her ear, she might have a risk for what? Preeclampsia or gestational diabetes? <clears throat> no, they're both at risk. Is she at risk for preterm? Yeah, and it's usually um, severely preterm. Extreme, it's called extreme. So what do we want to do for her? So also uh, remember, um, <clears throat> polyhydramnios. There's just so much that goes on with the diabetic. She's at risk for infections, blood clots, all those things. So what are we doing for her because she's with all these risks? How are we caring for her? Besides maybe adjusting medications to, to try to get that blood sugar down. Nutrition. Diet. Okay. What else do we need to do? <clears throat> maybe she can walk every afternoon exercise a little bit yeah yeah if he's obese she has to lose weight maybe we're not talking about losing weight during pregnancy no we don't we don't go that direction we talk about eating controlling sugar okay okay so fetal surveillance what do we mean by fetal surveillance
like ultrasound to see how big he is. All right. Ultrasounds. BPP. Who remembers what a BPP is? Biophysical profile. Okay. BPP. So we have parameters. There's um, four parameters that we um, measure during an ultrasound. Okay. It indicates fetal well being. Okay. So that's the BPP. What else can we do? Fetal surveillance. So we're gonna be doing ultrasounds at least every couple of weeks to watch fetal well-being. What if your client calls you and says, I don't think my baby is moving much. I haven't felt my baby move today. Counting kicks, is that what you mean there? Okay, fetal kick counts. Now, there's no set standard how many times. Every provider probably would say something different, but I always told my clients, if you don't feel your baby move 10 times every hour, stop whatever you're doing and really focus on movement and let me know, okay? What else can we do to keep an eye on the well being of a baby? We do this a lot for um, uh, people who have uh, intrauterine growth restriction to monitor inter interuterine growth restriction, too. Besides blood uh, ultrasounds, we do what? Uh, Is it the catheter that observes them? Like how much they move? Okay, so the non-stress test. The non-stress test, right? Who remembers what that is? So we're gonna put the monitor on mother's belly and she's gonna let us know when she feels that baby move. And then we're gonna look at that because what, what will happen is she pushes a button and it marks the monitor when she feels a baby move. And then we can correlate that with baby's heart rate. So if the heart rate goes up and the baby moves, that's good. So that's what we're looking We're looking for a reactive uh, result. I'm trying to get that on there. Okay, so, so far so good. Okay, so let's talk about the interpartum period. Um, whether it's a diabetic, doesn't matter, a high risk baby. So how do we know a client's in true labor? Okay. Dilation. Cervical dilation with what? Regular contractions. Regular contractions. Okay. So if she is having those regular contractions and her cervix is, is dilating, we know she's in real labor. What's the Bishop score? You remember what the bishop score is? What does it tell us? That how close they are to labor? <clears throat> well, not really. 
Because I could be in labor. And we're, we're still, Is it the softening of the cervix? Or no? Okay, so it's the inducibility of the cervix. In other words, how soft is it? Is it dilated? Is it effaced? Is it anterior, posterior? Where's the fetal as far as the station of the fetus? So it's just a, a set of parameters. Away. Um, that indicate whether she's good to go into labor or how she is progressing during labor. Okay, so it's the condition of the cervix mainly, okay? Okay, so what are some things that affect labor? If you think about an obese person, um, a person that's receiving magnesium sulfate or an epidural, what are some things that affect the progress of labor? What affects the ability of it to progress nicely? Doesn't magnesium sulfate affect labor progression? In what way? It slows it down? It can, yes, it can. Because it relaxes the uterus a little bit. Right. Uh, what does it relax? The smooth muscle? Yeah, the smooth muscles. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else affects the ability of that to progress nicely? If you were going, let, let me give you a, a demonstration. Let's say you were with a group of friends and you love to go into caves and you're going, you're climbing and stepping down into the cave, what are some things that could hinder you? <laughs> That's an interesting way of looking at it or thinking about it. What, what would it be some things that you can't get through the cave? Maybe it's the woman is primigravida. The first time... Do you mean like the baby's shoulders or something like that? Or is that okay? One? So, yeah, so shoulder dystocia would be one thing. In other words, the the size of the baby, but if it's a large baby, the, the fetus itself, the passenger. So, I'm talking about the five P's. Okay. What about the passageway? If you're in a cave, is there any give to that passageway? No, it's it's hard. It doesn't give, just like scar tissue or the structure of the pelvis. It's too narrow. You can't get through it or you're too big to get through it. Okay, so those are the hindrances. Okay, contractions aren't, aren't efficient. They're not strong enough and they're not happening often enough. Okay. What about pain management? What would you recommend for a client that has um, is having a lot of pain in active labor? Breathing techniques. Okay, we could do some breathing techniques. Absolutely, some non-pharmacological um, strategies. What else? <laughs> I've lost you now. You're not as interested. This isn't as fun. What about an epidural? Yes. What if your client has been doing very well all along? She wanted to go natural and now she's um, dilated at eight centimeters and she's getting into that transition stage. And she says, I need something for pain. What would be a safe, effective pain management? Yeah, those aren't drag and drop, unfortunately. 
Is there like a block one that you can do? Yeah, pudendal block. Yeah, pudendal block. So that's when you have your patient lying down with the knees bent and right where you feel the ischial tuberosities. You know, when you're sitting on a bicycle and those bones get tired, those are your ischial tuberosities. So right above that, we can inject into the pudental nerve on each side. And it causes a block. It blocks those nerves, and those are sensory nerves. So that'll help with that low uh, perineal pain, vaginal pain. Okay, so that's a pudental block. What are some things we don't want to give during that time? We don't want to give morphine or butorphanol. Butorphanol, do you know what that is? Who knows what butorphanol is? It's a it's an opioid, but it's a partial opioid. Okay, so it's safe to give in 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 labor. It doesn't affect the fetus that much, but we certainly want to avoid opioids. So we want to avoid morphine, Demerol, um, fentanyl, and stuff like that late in labor because it depresses respiration of the fetus. Okay. Well, I lost you on that one. <laughs> Too much, wasn't it? Too much. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. It's, it, you want to take a break now? You want to go do something, one other thing before we go on? Before we take a break. Would you, Christina, you're you're muted, so I didn't hear you. Sorry, my, my niece and my daughter are like over here painting my face and stuff, so... <laughs> <laughs> If you can't see you're, you're, all these thoughts on my face, they're not natural. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Let's see. What else can we do for a few minutes? How many of you have been to um, the case study, Anna case study? Okay, so this is about I think it's um, and it's really it's good. Let me share my screen. So this is Anna. So this is about prenatal care, but it's good because it, it, it talks about everything and then we go into some problems, okay? So this is an unfolding case study and she's a prima gravida, which means what? What's a prima gravida? First baby? First, first pregnancy, first pregnancy, okay? First conception, okay? So she, you can read her demographic information here. Um, she's 19 years old. Okay. She thinks she's pregnant and she's coming in for her first visit. All right. So let me erase this. I didn't erase it from my, oh, that's okay. So this is her, more of her vital, uh, vital signs and her, uh, well, not too much of her vital signs. This is her weight her BMI, her gestational age. Uh, so she's nine weeks and five days. Um, her GP status then is G1P0000, okay? Her last menstrual period 
was January 6th of this year. Okay. And we figured out Nagel's rule earlier today was uh, due date is October 13th, 2023 this year. Okay. So down at the bottom of this screen, I have the two formulas for calculating BMI. Okay. You might have to do that. Not for probably for this HESI, but probably for the NCLEX. All right. So Anna, she comes in, she thinks she's pregnant. Okay, so this is a review of the presumptive symptoms, what she's experiencing. Something we can't see, something we don't measure, but she says, okay, that's what we mean by we're presuming she's pregnant because she's telling us things, you know, oh, it does sound like you could be pregnant, you know. But we can give her a more definitive answer. Probably you're pregnant by an exam. So if we examine her, what do we see? Uh, of course, we're going to get the positive pregnancy test. Goodell sign, Chadwick sign, Braxton Hicks, um, Blotment. So we see things that, oh, that's usually what we see when a client is pregnant. But we can't tell her for sure unless we hear a fetal heartbeat or unless we see a fetus or unless we feel that fetus in mom's tongue moving. Okay. Those are positive signs of pregnancy. And so our discussion was why do we do ultrasounds in pregnancy at the beginning? What are some reasons we would do an ultrasound early in pregnancy? Well, one thing, just to verify it, it, the woman is pregnant, okay? So a viable fetus. Is there a fetus there? Where is the fetus, okay? Where is the placenta? If she has a history of previa, we need to get an ultrasound to see where the placenta is. But usually the placenta location is not... Uh, for sure until closer to the second trimester, okay? Gestational age, how far along is she? Does she have more than one baby? Maybe she's bleeding. She's not hurting, but she's bleeding. What we call, what do we call that? If she's not in any pain and she's bleeding and she doesn't have a previa, what could be going on? Anybody want to take a guess? It's not a previa. It's not a molar pregnancy. She's not having any pain, but she is bleeding a little bit. The spontaneous abortion? Well, it's not called a spontaneous abortion. It's called a threatened abortion. Okay. So a threatened abortion, she's not having any pain, but she is bleeding a little. Now, if she's bleeding a lot and she's hurting, that's an inevitable abortion, okay? She's, she is losing the pregnancy, okay? And then there's some other reasons we do ultrasounds. All right, so what about Anna? So we've got her checked in, you might say. We're talking to her about her past medical history, um, some mild depression, okay? Because she lost her younger sister at the age of five with meningitis, OBGYN history, pretty uneventful. This is her first pregnancy. She's 19. She's never had a pap or a pelvic exam before. She only has one partner, it's her boyfriend, who's a father of her baby. Medications, she's trying to take her prenatal vitamins. If a container is labeled as prenatal, it has folic acid in it, okay? So why do we really want to make sure our pregnant women are on folic acid or taking folic acid? What's so important about folic acid? Tube defects. As a neural tube defects. Yes. Folic acid is a B vitamin. It's required for cell growth, okay? So if she doesn't have enough of it in her system, you know, that neural tube not, might not close completely, 
Okay. She doesn't smoke any tobacco. She doesn't smoke any cannabis, use any illicit drugs or opioids. Um, doesn't ever drink alcohol. Family history. Mother's alive with high blood pressure. A father, high blood pressure. Mother has diabetes. Um, sister had a her second pregnancy. She had preeclampsia, which is something we tend to see in families. Um, so Anna's increased risk for preeclampsia because her sister had it, okay? Um, and then her deceased sister, and she has a brother with substance use disorder and a brother that's just alive and well. So that's her family history. And we have to take those things into account, right? So social history, I'll let you read this. I don't see the screen. Nobody sees it? I do. I see it. You, you do? Yeah. I don't understand. You can't see it, Daniela? No. I can see you, but not the, but not your screen. So you need to. Hmm. Let me try it again. Now can you see it. Now? Yes. You see it now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good. I'll let you read it, Daniela. Okay, so there's a lot going on with Anna's life, isn't there? There's a lot of concerns. So when we screen for, for abuse, intimate partner violence, screen for depression, we're asking basic questions to see if we need to really dig into the information, if we need to do something else. So screening for intimate partner violence, you might begin by just asking, and there are screening tools Okay, and there's one in your book on intimate partner violence, asking her, are, do you feel safe at home? Has anybody ever hurt you? So just basic questions um, uh, about depression. We would definitely want to use a tool to assess where she is, if she's really depressed or just a little mildly depressed, so that we can refer back to that tool, that questionnaire later on and ask her and then compare. So risk factors for Anna are gonna be a lot. So her weight, her age, her social history, her financial stresses, a lot of it. Her family history, if I didn't say that. So in our first prenatal visit, we're gonna do vital signs, get her weight, calculate her BMI, check her urine, uh, draw some labs, and then we're gonna, we can go ahead and draw some uh, blood for carrier screening. See if she has any genes that are abnormal. 
Okay, so like sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, PKU, of course, she would probably know if she had PKU. Okay, so we're going to check all those things. Um, <clears throat> check her blood type. Do a physical exam. Okay, we're going to check her thyroid. Uh, thyroid, it does enlarge a little bit during pregnancy. We're going to do a breast exam and we're going to teach her how to do a breast exam and when to do it when she's not pregnant. Okay, so that's seven days after her period ends is a good time to do a breast exam. We're going to assess her heart and her lungs. And at this point, when I'm assessing heart and lungs, I'll listen to the lungs and I'm thinking, I hear a little wheezing. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you I had asthma. So sometimes a client will forget to tell you if there's anything going on, okay? Abdomen, extremities, uh, pelvic exam, bimanual, a speculum exam. That's when we would see the Chadwick's uh, and the uh, Goodell's. We'd be able to assess all of that with a bimanual exam, okay? And we want to do some cultures, okay? Yeah. Can we hear? Fetal heart tones at nine weeks and five days with a Doppler. Anybody remember when we can hear fetal heart tones with a Doppler? Nine weeks and five days. <laughs> Naomi's looking it up. She's got her HESI book out. That's going to tell her. You know, I noticed a discrepancy in the HESI book. It says that the Chadwick sign is a, a uh, presumptive sign of pregnancy. It's not. Did you find it, Naomi? Okay, it says at 12 weeks, the heart is discernible by ultrasound. Oh, we can see it before then. 18 days. 18 days? No. When I put a Doppler, Doppler on her belly, how soon can I hear a fetal heart tone? Nine weeks. Nine weeks. Nine weeks. I've never heard one before then. And I think your book says nine weeks. Okay. So uh, we did carry screening already. Now, the, um, and it was um, negative for sickle cell. Everything was normal for Anna. Her blood type, A positive. Are we concerned about anything with her blood type? Are we concerned about Rogam or needing any Rogam with A positive? No. No, 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 uh-uh, no, she has it. We don't need to give it to her, okay? So we're going to do fetal heart tones again on this visit, and we're going to draw some blood, and we're checking for um, the maternal marker called AFP, okay? So AFP is one, and HCG is another marker, okay? So the, uh, the maternal serum marker screening, AFP, if it's low, down syndrome. So I always remember low down, okay? And usually with down syndrome, the a ACG is high. Neural tube defects, it's the opposite. The AFP is high and the HCG is low. So they're just completely opposite. So if we do the blood test and we get abnormal results, Usually the next thing we want to do is do an ultrasound to see if we can see anything. Obviously, that tells us that the baby could have Down syndrome or a neural tube defect. Okay. So, um, and then we might do an amniocentesis. Now, what are we collecting when we do an amniocentesis? Amniotic fluid. 
some amniotic fluid. So we're going to test um, We're going to test the the, am, uh, the amniotic fluid for AFP, so it's more sensitive and more specific. It's still not diagnostic, okay? But it gives us, it tells us, oh, okay, pretty good indication. The baby has spina bifida or a neural tube defect of some sort because the AFP is high and the HCG is low in the amniotic fluid as well as mother's blood, okay? What do we want to do for her with for her low back pain? At 15 weeks gestation. Tylenol? Well, we can just teach her some exercises, okay? Some exercises to stretch her back muscles, some pelvic rocking, that sort of thing. And we can also send her to a physical therapist that's a subspecialist, so like a women's health physical therapist, and she knows what to do. Remember, ligament pain is from two hormones. Two hormones that relax ligaments. So ligaments are between the bones, right? So things are little, that pelvis is more fluid. So back pain is not uncommon in pregnancy, even early in pregnancy. So that's progesterone and relaxin. That's what's causing the ligament and the back pain early in pregnancy. Okay. So now we're at week 20. So we're doing a general just a gross anatomy ultrasound. Okay. Every client at 20 weeks gets, gets an anatomical ultrasound. Okay. So it looks good. It's normal. And then we're measuring the fundal height as well. So uh, what happens, Anna actually does her glucose tolerance test at week 24. Usually, routinely, we do this at week 28. Why are we doing it early on Anna? Anybody remember what's in her history that gives us so many? History. 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 So family Over history. What did you say? Obesity. Obesity, exactly. So she's obese. She's got a family history and she's Hispanic. All three of those are high risk to develop diabetes. And so she's prone to gestational diabetes because she doesn't have diabetes right now. So we do glucose tolerance test. Okay. 50 grams of glucose in a juice, in a drink. So she comes to the office fasting we have her drink the glucose and we draw her sugar, draw her glucose level. And we want it to be below 135 in an hour, okay? Hers was 148, so it's high, okay? If it's high, then we have them come back and do a three hour test, okay? Three hour, and then we, we determine if she is gestational based off of that. So um, if one value is abnormal, then um, we don't give, we don't diagnose her, but if there's two values that are abnormal, we do. So in this one, her fasting was 110 and her one hour is 148. So she is diagnosed with gestational diabetes here, okay? So she comes back at week 28 and we're reviewing her blood glucose log after we did all this education, okay? And she's showing postprandial hyperglycemia. In other words, 
after she eats, her blood glucose is too high. So we do start her on um, uh, gliburide once a day, oral medication. And so this is a gestational diabetic. And remember what we were talking about. She's at risk for preterm, extreme prematurity. Um, um, uh, what else were we talking about? Respiratory distress in her newborn afterwards. Um, she's at, at, you know, at risk for a macrosomic baby and so forth. So we're going to do fetal surveillance on her. We're going to do ultrasounds more often. Okay. So at week 30, she's actually at this, her baby's actually at the 75th percentile. Okay. What happens with Anna? She develops preeclampsia. Okay. So she has a headache and we determined what we needed to do was collect some labs to see how far the preeclampsia actually has been progressing. Okay. So she calls and says she has a headache. And when she comes in, we do her blood pressure. It's high and there's protein in her urine. So we determine, let's do some labs. And if the labs are normal, we'll let her go home. And she just needs to monitor her blood pressure and come back the next week. So her labs were abnormal. So we end up admitting her to the hospital with preeclampsia. Okay. All right. Let's take a break. I have a question. Yes. Um, I've just, I've never missed any time for an online class before, but we're allowed to miss under a certain amount, correct? Yes, Dorothy. Do you need okay. to leave? I do. I just, I needed to be off by 3.30 today. So since we're taking the break, I will be back on. I just, I can't make it for the last hour. Okay. All right. All right, Dorothy. That's fine. I, I understand. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, well, we have to come back from the break. Yes, you do have to come back from the break. No, I, I mean, how long is the break? <laughs> oh, okay. Let's uh, what be time? Back. I think she's asking the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about uh, 4.30? Okay. That's Eastern time. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so next week, you know, taking your HESI is considered your class time, your attendance, okay? So we don't meet next Wednesday, all right? Um, and then the following week is week 12. And this is, uh, and I didn't put it in here, but week 12, you have to have re remediation completed by Tuesday of week 12. Um, I don't remember what the date is, week 12, okay? You have to have it completed. And then if you meet with me, so I'll have all through the week, I'll have um, times that you can just jump on Zoom. I'll be on Zoom and you're just checking in with me. And that gives you your attendance. So there's no um, Wednesday class during that week. OK, but I will have that time available in case that works for your schedule. OK. Um, and then, of course, the, the remediation is mandatory um, if you don't do it. Uh, according to your score. So if you score 900 or higher, uh, you still have to do one hour. So in your HESI NextGen account, um, it'll have your remediation information in there, how much you need to do. Um, and so you're gonna be working on the packets. Uh, there's packets and then there's case studies. Um, I would rather you spend time on the packets first. And you can always ask me about those things later. If your score is 700 to 749, then you have five hours of remediation to complete. Um, I always look at um, if you finished all the packets and you still haven't reached your five hours or your four hours 
or whatever your required amount is, um, then you need to start doing your case studies. Um, and then if you just d get it all done and you still haven't spent the hours, then I don't worry about it, okay? So I'll be checking on you as you complete it. And you don't have to do it at one sitting. Uh, you can do it chunks of time, but as long as it's due, it, it's done and completed by Tuesday uh, of week 12, you'll be fine. Any questions about your HESI? So everybody in the Pensacola campus, are you all signed up on Proctor U and you know what you're doing? Hmm? <laughs> Any questions about Proctor U? Have you registered to take your exams? Yes. Anybody need help with registering? Yeah, so mine isn't showing. I have a different class showing up online. So do you need to contact you or my campus? Let's see here. You, who is this? Is that you, Liz? It's uh -huh. not showing up. Um, when you go into your HESI next gen, Mm -hmm. it does, our maternity is not showing up uh -uh. it shows up as a different class so mine <clears throat> sorry mine wasn't showing up either but if you go in, to the left hand side and click on your name you can change your cohort and mine was in a different one of those so i just had to go through there right. until it showed maternity one Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. cohort i forgot about the cohort yeah, yeah change you, it you, and it'll update after like a second and then click on home and it should show. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. All right. Good. Anybody have any questions about what we talked about already? <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's talk about the, the HESI. So when you get ready to take your HESI, make sure you are all rested up, okay? Don't cram for your HESI. Don't do last minute reading and studying. Um, get a good night's sleep. Um, if you go in with a negative attitude, you feel like, man, this course has been so hot so hard. Um, yeah, I did well on the last exam, but uh, I just, this is just so hard and you're panicking. Don't, you don't talk yourself into doing poorly. Okay. You have learned a lot during this quarter. You really have more than probably what you realize. And so keep that in mind as you're going in there and just prove to yourself that yes, I've learned a lot and I can figure this out. Okay. So please just get some good sleep and eat right a couple of days before, make sure you're eating right. Um, stay away from junk food, okay? Get some good nutrition in your belly and, and feed your brain, okay? And then just use all the study tools that we're providing you, um, all the recordings, um, all the recommendations for um, studying like the NCLEX questions and the HESI book. Um, and I'll put some more information in the announcements about which pages to focus on. So use the tools that we give you. Um, try not to go beyond that. Go outside and, and do stuff because all the information you need is what we've given you. Okay. All right. Let's answer some questions. I don't know why this comes up this way. Just ignore. Okay, so let's answer some questions and then um, we'll determine if we need to do anything after that. Okay, so read about this client and tell me what the best answer is.
Does that help? <laughs> Are we supposed to pick one? Yeah. Okay. I want to say three, but I might be wrong. Me too. Let's say three. So why is this a good one? Why did you pick three? Well, I know like number one is is completely wrong. But I was telling her she would be too, gaining too much. I I think. And Aren't you supposed to gain the four pounds in the first trimester? Okay. Okay. I think 20 pounds is normal during the pregnancy. This says more, gain 20 more pounds. So that's why I think number one is wrong. That's what I was saying, but. Okay. Yeah, the, usually the average of, uh, weight gain we usually recommend is 25 or 35 pounds. Oh, okay. But every, every client is different, okay? So why was, why was number three the best answer? Because it's disgusting her eating habits what she's eating yeah yeah so that really focuses in on the needs of the client better right mm -hmm. it's 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 about weight gain but it's more important that we know what they're eating okay and how much and when okay we just want to make sure the nutrition is there right that's why it's the best answer okay Number four. So very good. Why is number four the correct answer? Because there's only one day missing. <laughs> but she has her in regular period, that would be something that is normal. Okay. Okay. Well, the first one's not right. Why isn't the first one right? It doesn't say if she's an athlete. Yeah, it says nothing about her athleticism, does it? Okay, number two um, is not appropriate, not really at all. Okay, and repeating the test at home in one week could be an answer. But as a clinician, as a nurse, you want to know more information. So you're going to ask her, well, are your periods usually regular? And missing one day, you could also go at, ask her, you know, have you ever missed a day before? What makes you think that you could be pregnant? Yeah, that sort of thing. So it's asking for more information. That's why I think it's the best answer. All right. All right, so my dog is snoring in the background if you hear her. <laughs> okay, so read this next one and see what you think a good answer is. So there's more than one correct answer here, okay? So what do we know about sickle cell trait? It's autosomal recessive. Okay, it is autosomal recessive, yes. 
So that means what, Naomi? Is it 5% chance if it's recessive? So if it's recessive, it means that both parents have to have the gene. Yeah, both parents have to have it in order for the baby to have a chance of having the disease, okay? And then is it the 25% chance of having it or carrying so, it? Okay, for carrying it, there's a 50% chance, okay? Uh, but we'll if both parents, if both parents have the gene, there's a one in, in uh, four chance or 25% chance that they have a child with a disease, okay? So number two is not correct. So if it says, um, if it says your fetus has a 25% of having sickle cell disease, that would be correct. But carrying the gene is a 50% chance. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the um, AFP test has nothing to do with um, sickle cell disease. That's about Down syndrome and um, um, neural tube defects. Okay. Carrier screening is correct because that's what we're doing. We're drawing blood to see if she carries a screen. So the first one and the last one are correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. This baby's waving at us. Actually, it looks like that baby's sucking his thumb. B. D. B as in boy, the anatomy ultrasound. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so everybody gets that that anatomy ultrasound at 20 weeks. Three, three. Yep. Do you know what foods should be avoided? I don't think we talk about this much in this class. What are some foods that pregnant women need to avoid? Raw food, like sushi and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, and so anything that's not cooked, um, even deli meat, sometimes it's not completely cooked. Um, like if you buy um, beef, it still might be peak in the middle. Um, soft so she needs to well. throw that in the microwave. What? Soft cheeses. Yeah, some uh, the cheeses that are not pasteurized. Exactly. Uh, canned tuna. Uh, one serving a week, probably okay. But beyond that, no, because tuna is a large fish and the mercury content is greater in, in that kind of a fish. So we ask, even though it's canned, we ask, we usually advise to avoid tuna, too much tuna. Good. Got a lot of 16 year olds. You know. I will go with two. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's always better, right? We're addressing and acknowledging what she's experiencing. Um, the other ones are just very inappropriate, okay? Even though we know at 10 weeks, her baby's not really big enough to move, we're not gonna say that. The baby's moving, but she's just not feel it. Okay, so I've got arrows that I can move. <laughs> okay, so read this picture and tell me what is the arrow pointing at? What week gestation? Paul? So you think right here, she's 36 weeks pregnant? Two. Maybe 28. I was going to say 28, but I wasn't really completely sure. I'll say 20. 20 is correct. Right at the umbilicus, about 20 weeks. Okay. So here's the scale. So you can usually palpate the fundus once it's up behind from the pubic bone, and that's usually around 12 weeks. Okay, so at the umbilicus, it's about 20 weeks or so. And then so every centimeter, it's usually another week. And then at 40 weeks, it drops down. And that's called what? What's it called when the fundus descends a little bit? What, what's a term we call when the baby drops? Lightning. Lightning, yeah, lightning. Remember, lightning drops out of the sky. All right. Now, this one was a hard one for some of the other students to answer. What do you think about this? Inside? Two. The three. Your book talks about uh, the psychological responses or uh, expected uh, reactions to an unplanned pregnancy or even a planned pregnancy. And it talks about ambivalence those first few weeks of the pregnancy even if it's planned, um, because the reality of it hasn't hit them yet. So they're, they're kind of ambivalent about their feelings. Do they want, do, are they excited or are they upset? They're, it's like, they're not sure how they're feeling. And some of it has to do with hormones, but even the male partner goes through this. So your, your text talks about this. And that's why I wanted to bring it to the forefront because we haven't talked about it but they might ask you on the HESI and it might be on the NCLEX, the ambivalent feelings, especially if there's a lot of stressors in life, um, young person, they might have those feelings of ambivalence. Um, depression and anxiety and rejection um, are too, too, uh, too similar, not only mean similar, but, but not necessarily a for sure thing, but most women go through a little bit of ambivalence for just those first weeks or so. Okay, one more thing here. This is my last question. Now you're the nurse here, not the student. Okay. <laughs> three. Three. Yeah, three. <clears throat> so you have to tell me why you think three is good. 
because you're validating her concerns kind of open-ended yes yeah yeah exactly exactly although some of the other ones you know might be good like uh, you and the baby's child will find a way, or I suggest you contact your professors. Those might be valid, but not the very this question before, because I have heard this before. Like this is a, this is a struggle that I think a lot of girls deal with in school right now, actually. Yep. 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 You're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. All right. Any questions about that? Any anything at all you want to go over? I'm going to I'm going to get some more questions added to that list and and have them for the next group uh, tutoring because I think I'm getting some questions from a different source and I'm kind of developing my own questions to help you answer questions, if that makes sense. Um, because sometimes it's not that you don't know the, the information, it's that you just, the, the way you answer a question, like, like you all mentioned, um, you're acknowledging feelings. You're always gonna be the client advocate. You want them to know information. You don't need to give them pat answers. Okay. All right. How many of you um, have been, I asked you this once and I don't think any of you, but one person had been to another instructor session, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Christina has. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the announcement, I gave you two PowerPoints for the HESI. One was um, an updated version for March. And then there was another one that was just Everything was in it. Have, have you looked at those at all? Yes, no, yes, no, yes. Okay, good, good. And I also posted Professor McBride's session from Monday. So be, take the time to watch that. Um, she said it was a really fun time. It was good. So, you know, watch it. It's a lot of interactive stuff, kind of like what we did today. So look at that, okay. Um, so what else do we need? We need to spend a few more minutes together. I don't Will the other else. instructors' classes be recorded and posted? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there was, so far, there's just been two Monday classes. My Monday class was a disaster because I went over uh, one of the HESI PowerPoint slides and they, they knew nothing. <laughs> they, they didn't know how to answer the questions and it was really sad. Um, so I didn't, I didn't post that recording. I didn't want to embarrass them, um, but hopefully I gave them some guidance on what, what they need to do. So I um, think that the so best thing is, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt you, but it's um, Professor McBride's her cahoots. They help so much. Like you can yeah. even go on there and practice without, you know, like doing it with the class. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not that familiar with the Kahoot. Uh, and yes, it's good for some students. And I always post P Professor McBride's if, if I have them um, so that students can, can join her. And she's had some sessions throughout the quarter. So uh, I do that, but that's not one thing I do. <laughs> I think she's the only teacher that actually does it. Actually, Professor McGuffey will do it too. Oh, really? Is that a maternity teacher? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I have no. There's six of us. There's six of us. So, yeah. yeah, we're trying to be creative to help you, you know, think and engage instead of just sitting here me talking, which I know there are sometimes uh, that I have to talk, um, just because. Uh, let me see if I can pull something up for us to look at. Now this one I didn't give to you, but it covers a lot, but it doesn't cover everything. Okay, come on.
right. So here's our, our little fetus. So Nagel's rule, first day of the last menstrual period, subtract three months, add seven days, and then add a bear. I mean year. <laughs> Gravidity and parity. So what is a parity? What is a parity? How many what do we pregnancies mean? lasted to 20 weeks? Or okay. Past 20 weeks? Okay. 20, yeah, 20 weeks and beyond. Okay. So 20 weeks and beyond deliveries. Okay. So if you have a client that delivered a girl at 37 weeks, had a pregnancy loss at 18 weeks, delivered a boy at 35 weeks and had one induced abortion last year, what's her G status? How many times has she gotten pregnant? In other words. Four. Four. So read it again. Five. Five. Yeah, she's yeah, she's pregnant now. I'm gonna stop my video because I think my internet is slow. Okay. So how many full term babies? One. How about preterms? One. How many abortions? Two. Two, oops. <laughs> That's a lot. Two, and then how many living children does she have? Two. Two, okay. So how many times has she conceived? How many pregnancies? Four. Three. And that picture doesn't show three children. She's got an older one that's in school, so. <laughs> three, yeah, three. It doesn't say she's pregnant right now. Okay. Full term? One. Zero. Yeah, 36 week is not full term. It's 37, right? Right, 37. <laughs> How many preterms? Two. <laughs> So how many um, preterm pregnancies? Okay. So the 34 weeks stillborn is still considered a pregnancy. How many abortions? Zero. And then how many living children? Two. Two. That's why she's only holding two children. <laughs> it's been a while since I used this PowerPoint. Okay. So remember the physiology of pregnancy. Um, a lot more plasma, right? A lot more blood. Less blood, fl um, more blood flow in the periphery at a lower pressure. So less vascular resistance. She is at risk for blood clots. 
because of the changes in her uh, coagulation factors. So she could be lightheaded, faint, which is the same thing, nasal stuffiness, um, um, also um, exacerbation of hemorrhoids and, and any kind of um, varicosities during pregnancy. This is your carrier screening. So this is the autosomal recessive, okay? So mother and father, unusual gene, which would be an abnormal gene. So they usually, they're both carrying an abnormal gene. And so you see that one child in four here actually has the disorder, okay? Two of them are carriers. And then one is not either affected and one is not a carrier. Okay. That's your autosomal recessive. I should have put that down here. All right. So when we do amniocentesis, we can do them early in the pregnancy or later, okay? If we have an abnormal AFP, um, we can do an amniocentesis and we do an ultrasound at the same time um, to identify um, any, uh, in, the, in the fluid, to identify any um, abnormal AFP levels, okay? So high AFP, would indicate neural tube defects. We can do amniocentesis in the third trimester to look at the lung maturity. So do you remember when lungs are usually mature? What age? How many weeks? 35. Yeah. Okay, so that means LS ratio should be two to one, okay? So reactive non-stress test is good. The heart rate of the fetus increases with movement. It means that the fetus is being well oxygenated. There's no trouble with blood flow from the placenta to the fetus. And the contraction stress test is actually causing contractions. And we do these to see how well a fetus will tolerate labor. So a positive or a reactive one is bad. So it's the opposite. In other words, if the heart rate of the fetus drops, it's reactive. And that means that the contraction is actually causing deceleration so that the, the placenta is not well perfused. There's some kind of deficiency there. So our Can fetal testing. Con contraction stress tests were causing a contraction. And a positive response is the baby's heart rate drops during the contraction. So that's called positive or it's called reactive. And those are both bad. Okay, so we'll do a contraction stress test if we want to see how well a fetus will tolerate labor. Okay, okay. thank you. Yes. And we talked about this a little bit, the surveillance, ultrasounds frequently, and then kick counts. And we can always do the NST test then as part of the surveillance. What's this? Uh, pika or pika. Yep, yep. Eating something that's not supposed to be eaten. <laughs> so what's it a sign of? Iron deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia. That's right. 
So folic acid, very important to prevent neural tube defects, which is what's going on here. This is a myelomeningocele. It's the um, a cyst that contains um, part of the spinal nerves. Okay, and they've been damaged. Um, they didn't close up. So this baby might have trouble um, ambulating and have like a neurogenic bladder or spastic muscles in the lower extremities. So folic acid will help help prevent this. Not all the time. Uh, it's sometimes it's just a genetic issue. Um, but we've found out that folic acid helps reduce it. So folic acid is found in uh, fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, some beans, lentils and limas, things like that. So we want our mother to have adequate levels of folic acid even before she gets pregnant. So teen, when a teen gets pregnant, it's high risk, okay? Uh, we're concerned about good nutrition uh, and other high risk issues, uh, weight gain, understanding, uh, education. Um, a lot of these teens will experience intrauterine growth restriction um, because the fetus is not getting what it needs. Um, so we need to make sure we're monitoring um, her weight, uh, review, reviewing with her uh, what good nutrition is, um, uh, prenatal vitamins, um, such as that. So other things that can cause intrauterine growth restriction is mom has some kind of vascular disease, diabetes, um, high blood pressure can also reduce um, fetal growth. Certain metoprolol, um, any, some beta blockers will reduce blood flow and causes uterine uh, restrict or uh, intrauterine growth restriction. And just being underweight, so we're, see, we're seeing low birth weight babies. Not necessarily preterm, but just low birth weight. Hyper, hyperemesis, we, we know that this is diagnosed because of electrolyte deficiency. That's how we know the difference between nausea and vomiting and hyperemesis is because of the, the hypokalemia in particular. Exercise, a normal BMI is 18 to 25. That's ideal, I should say ideal. Okay, so first trimester up to four pounds like we talked about. Second trimester, one to one and a half pounds, two pounds a week. We talked about this a little bit. Pyrosis, heartburn, iron supplements. 300 calories more a day is usually what is required. Um, and we might tell our clients that at the beginning of the pregnancy, that they will have to have adequate prenatal nutrition. So um, your book, and this was a test question asking you about uh, majority of calories should come from which um, uh, um, nutrients. Uh, and so it's fats and it's complex carbohydrates, both. So each one of those 40%, that's 80% of our calories should come from fat, and complex carbohydrates. You notice that only leaves 20% for protein, okay? So most of our energy is from the complex carbohydrates. So what foods are complex? Like potatoes, um, pasta. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So CHOs is carbohydrates. 
So we know that smoking causes smaller babies because nicotine causes constriction of the vessels. So low birth weight. And then street drugs or illicit drugs and prescriptions were recommending uh, partial agonists like methadone, partial opioid agonists during pregnancy. Um, that reduces the um, uh, withdrawal symptoms in a, in a newborn. So a mother can continue to take those drugs and breastfeed because it's better for her baby. Okay. What are some signs that you would see in a newborn if you were suspecting NAS? I did cry. Okay. What else? Tremors. Tremors, yeah. Very rigid muscles, very hypertonic muscles, just never relaxed, you know, very tense. Okay, what else? They're difficult to comfort. Difficult to comfort, very difficult to console. Yeah, feeding problems, um, dis, um, uncoordinated sucking and swallowing, um, um, nausea, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, those sorts of things, restless. Torch, don't memorize the torch infections, okay? Just um, be aware that um, they all present very similar. Um, so a really good investigation, you know, doing cultures and getting history from mom is very important. Signs of preterm labor, low pelvic pain, abdominal pressure, low back pain, dull back pain, okay? Um, Change of vaginal discharge, watery or bloody uh, discharge. The five Ps. Don't want to go over that. We haven't talked about anything about um, what's the best. What amount of um, variability do you want to see in a fetal heart rate? Moderate? Moderate, yeah, moderate amount. Moderate amount means that that baby's heart rate goes up and down between 60 and 25 beats more per minute. So it's not always the same. Okay, know your variable and your late decelerations. We need to intervene. So what would you do if you saw variable decelerations on the monitor? Those V-shaped ones over here. What would you do? Anybody I remember? What would you do if you saw those on the monitor? Your baby's suffering. Hurry up. What would you do? <laughs> Move the mommy. Oh, in what chest? position? In what position? Need a chest. Need chest position, yes. That's an umbilical cord prolapse, right? So resuscitation, if you see an abnormal rhythm or um, pattern, not rhythm, pattern, uh, either core compression or late decelerations, you need to stop any Pitocin that's infusing. Change your mother's position, give her some oxygen, extra fluid, um, and call for help.
So there is a lot of teaching when we have a client that's scheduled for a cesarean birth. We have to consider all of the preoperative um, um, strategies we have and in, in planning and postoperative. So usually C-sections, they're NPO, just in case there's a problem, okay? Sequential devices on the legs to prevent clots, a Foley catheter. Um, INO is very important during surgery, knowing how much blood loss, how much fluid they've had, and then how much urine output they've had. We need a Foley also because if the surgeon were to accidentally nick the bladder, then we would see blood in the Foley. And that way we know there's a problem. Okay. And then teaching. Um, immediately um, caring for a client that's been has that's had anesthesia, um, safety issues, and then hygiene and infection risks, and then discharge instructions. We don't want any, them doing any abdominal exercises. Postpartum hemorrhage, subinvolution, right? A boggy uterus. So what is your priority assessment? The, the uterine fundus. When you go to see a post postpartum client, you're, you're going to assess the fundus. And then you're gonna check the bladder, okay? To make sure that that bladder stays empty. And so you're teaching, okay? Teach your client, keep your bladder empty so that your uterus can contract, okay? And then uterotonics, methogen, oxytocin. So here's just another intervention for uh, um, going into hypovolemic um, shock. Okay, uterine atony from it a retained placenta or some laceration or a blood cl clotting problem, okay? So a client that's going into shock because they've lost a lot of volume, it's gonna be cool and clammy, pale, tachycardic tachypnea, okay? And this is true for anybody going into shock from blood loss. Those are the symptoms and signs that you'll see. So once you know your client is stable, um, the, the uterus is contracting nicely, then you wanna finish your assessment. Look at the lochia. Um, if she's still bleeding a lot, what would she be bleeding from now? If you know the uterus is contracting and yet there's still a lot more blood loss, what would that be coming from? Anybody want to gander? A laceration? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lacerations or some hematoma. Usually the lacerations is what we see or uh, a laceration that has been repaired and that has come loose. The sutures have come loose, okay? So we've not talked anything about um, uh, the baby or anything else yet. So I'll do that the next uh, class. And where is everybody? Okay. Okay. So we'll talk more about intrapartum um, with the next group tutoring. You know, since we've covered a lot of antepartum. So we'll do intrapartum and postpartum and then newborn. Okay. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll let you go. Thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. You're welcome. Hi, Mindy. Hey, Liz.